My name is Anna Marie, and this is my story. So Anna Marie, can you tell us where, where you grew up at, how your childhood was, and just from childhood all the way to your teenage years, what happened in those times? Okay. So I grew up, I was born and raised in Monrovia, Duarte. I was born in Duarte, raised in Monrovia, um, in church. My parents were both Christians, but there was a lot of chaos in the home. Um, the abuse of, not just abuse verbally, but physically. Um, there was drugs, alcohol, gang members. Um, my parents were never gang members, but they were always around our house, our home. Um, Your parents weren't gang members, but the gang members were coming over, right? So were they like the parents of the of the neighborhood in a sense, or it just was the house to go to, or how how that take place? Well, it's, it took place because of my grandparents. Um, my grandfather was actually um, he was a marine. Um, but he was like the parent in the street for the gang members to come to the home. So there was a lot of parties and stuff. Um, my parents were never from there. My grandfather wasn't from there. Um, but they did hang out there. So that place being the, being the hangout place with the gang members and stuff like that, um, you started seeing things, right? Seeing the street life, but also like what was going on in the home? Uh, what was going on in the home was, um... My dad was very loving. My mom um, wasn't so loving, I guess, because um, she would tell me, you know, like when she was pregnant with me, she always would try to hide it. Um, so wearing the tight jeans and stuff, you know, her body starts to change. So um, when she would tell me that as a young girl, like I felt like um, rejected. Um, so when my father would come home, very loving, you know, untying his shoes and and putting on his boots and, you know, walking around. And my mom would come and serve my dad food. And, you know, he, she would just like, where are you? Where, you know, the abuse would start, the arguing and the fighting and where he would throw the plate and the, I mean, it would get physical. Um, so as kids, you know, here, my father's very loving to his kids and, and, you know, cooking for us and stuff like that. He did a lot. Um, and my mom also, you know, she did what she knew um, how to do. I guess you can say so it was tough um, going to church and then coming home to chaos you know arguing in the cars I mean we hear about that now like for me as a Christian um, you know we always want to walk with integrity um, because people are watching you know most of our kids so for me it was um, it was tough um, there was a there was a time where they divorced I was probably like around seven eight or eight ish um, and I had my little brother, um, it was me, my brother, and my little sister, Selena. Um, it was tough. Um, my mom, uh, we became homeless. Um, after they separated, we became homeless because my mom really didn't work. So um, she would do what she could, you know, working at Talk About and stuff like that. Um, there was still abuse, you know, if we got in trouble, it was always my fault. <laughs> so, and I took a lot of the blame, you know, I always try to protect my brother and my sister. Um, so my mom ends up um, probably like around nine or nine and a half. Um, my mom, she met a Marine um, and that was my, he became my stepfather and there was also abuse. Um, he moved us away to Oregon probably for like a year. It was so cold and stuff. So it was, um, it was weird. It was different. We left in the middle of the night. Um, didn't tell our grandparents or anything like where we were going. None of the family knew like, we were just like, it was like we were kidnapped. <laughs> mm. It was weird, you know, like in the middle of the night we left. So wow. um, to Oregon and um, it became, uh, my stepdad was more of, uh, before it was my stepdad, he moved us away. We we're there in Oregon. And um, again, the abuse was different. Um, like a uh, touchy Philly, you know, hugging for a long time, come and sit on my lap. Um, stuff that I knew was wrong. Um, but my mom encouraged, like, not really understanding, like, he was abusing in that way. But I always stayed away from him. He was, I just didn't, it was, like, for me, creepy as a kid. <laughs> you know, um, trying to sit on a grown man's lap that supposedly loved my mom. Um, the physical, like, um, because if he would say, like, do this, and I would be like, no. Like, I, I felt like I was really rebellious, but I had a voice. Um, and I would use my voice, and I would be like, no, mom, like, I don't feel like he is 
like being that father in a sense and um it it took me like probably really quick to figure it out um i ended up going with a friend i stayed with a friend after school and she had volleyball practice and i was like i want to stay with you because i didn't want to go home to my stepdad so that i was like in fifth grade um they had they were going through the tryouts she's like come try out with me and i was like okay never picked up a volleyball in my life but i knew like i could find a way out if i could just if i could find in this sport you know like if i could be good i can i can um i can be good in that you know so it took me away from the home for a long time probably like throughout my whole like through 10th grade um so after a year of that, I made the team um, and my stepdad moved us to New Mexico to be closer to my mom's family. Um, and there again, you know, I found comfort in sports and out of I could be out of home. And, you know, the abuse just continued um, physically. Um, it started getting physical um, where he would tell me, you know, he, if I didn't do something that he wanted me to do, um, he would, oh, I'm going to I'm going to whip you get in the room and he would tell my mom you know she's being rebellious you know and i would go in the room and he's like pull your pants out and i'm like no you know you don't have to beat me like this <laughs> and that's what it came down to um the physical um even when my mom you know it became so much that i was always getting whipped and my brother and sister um that i would i was just like you know what i'm just gonna take the abuse and before you know it i was numb to it um so at the age of 15 um i ended up getting pregnant and when i got pregnant i didn't want to necessarily have the baby like i didn't know how to love myself how was i going to love another human being mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> sorry i didn't know how and i didn't want to i was very um I was very selfish. Um, it was about me and I knew I had a voice and I was going to use it. Um, so when my, my stepfather like found out I was pregnant, he said, I want her out of the house. And my mom's all, you have to go. And just like that. And I just literally like walked out of the door and I came to the street and I was just like, okay, this is going to be my life. <laughs> you know, um, my family didn't, um, they're like, oh, she's always rebellious, you know, she's always getting in trouble. And so that kind of became my first, middle, and last name, <laughs> trouble. Um, so here I am, pregnant, not really knowing what to do. My uh, An aunt and uncle reached out to me, and they said, hey, is there something going on in the home? And I was like, finally. And I said, yes, there's something going on in the home. You know, my stepdad and my aunt, already, she already knew. She was like, yeah. Um, she's a Christian and she's like, I knew something was wrong. Like, you're not just going to run away because or get kicked out of the house or pregnant because. Um, so she said, we, I can go live with them. So I moved to Texas with them for a little while. And uh, being pregnant, um, she's like, I'm going to take you to your doctor's appointment and stuff. So I was like, okay. She's like, we're going to get through this together. So it was, it was uh, actually amazing. Um, but I still had in the back of my mind, like, I didn't want to ruin this guy's life. I felt like I was going to ruin his life. And I remember praying and asking the Lord, like, just to take the baby. Um, after the prayer, um, the next day, morning, I woke up. It was early in the morning, and um, I was having a miscarriage. The whole bed was bloody. And um, I was like, in a way, in a sense, because I didn't know love or how to love. And I was like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, and... Um, he, uh, so I went through the process. I woke up my parent, my, my aunt, and my uncle, and they, um, they took me to the hospital. They performed that, uh, DNC on me and it. When I woke up from the whole thing, um, I just, I felt numb. I felt like God hears me and I'm just going to keep pushing. Um, in that moment, I was just like, I didn't want anything to do with my mom because she kind of chose my stepdad over me. Um, I didn't want nothing to do with the guy because he had a future and I didn't want to destroy it. Um, and so I just figured it was just me and God, <laughs> even in that moment, um, I just continued to push. Um, 
So right after that, when I did wake up from that procedure, uh, my mom was there. The mm -hmm. guy that I was pregnant from was there, and he's like, I'm still going to marry you. And I was like, no, you're not. I don't want nothing to do with you. Just live your life and do what you're supposed to do. Um, my mom's like, I'm going to California if you want to come, you know, and she apologized and um, she said we could start over. And I said, okay. <laughs> so as soon as we came to California, it was amazing because there was a lot of family around, plus um, the gang members were still in the same place at my, my grandparents' house. And that's where we live with my aunt. She, after my grandparents, you know, my grandfather passed away, she moved in. And so the cycle continued there. Um, there was a lot of gang members there and, and, you know, the partying and the drinking and stuff. And, you know, I, I just felt like it was something that, because I had a lot of rage, I guess, inside of me because of the abuse and my mom not sticking up for me um, or believing me. So I was going to put that energy because these people loved me. So I put that energy into them and to what they were doing. Um, I hurt a lot of people. Even at 15 years old, I hurt people. I carried around a bat and I used it um, because I felt accepted by the gangs. Um, and because I was a girl, like there was no way that it, back at that time that like, nobody would ever think that it was a girl that did that. So the guys, they would praise me. The other girls were like, oh, yeah, they looked up to me, and I was tough. So they gave me a nickname, and, you know, they said, um, you're going to fight this girl, which ended up being one of my cousins. She's from the rival neighborhood. Um, they brought her, and they said, okay, you want to get jumped in? You have, to, you have to fight. You have to fight this girl. So I did that, um, beat her up, and, and that began my career as a gang member. Um, I did a lot of stuff on the fly, like, Nobody would ever know it was me. So anytime the guys, because I seen the in and out, you know, of the gang members going to jail and, you know, and I'm like, I'll do it. Nobody will ever know it's me. Um, so I did that. Um, and that's how, like, the gang stuff became. Um, yeah. So I, my little brother kind of followed me. Um, he was only 17 years old and um, he's still in prison. Um, he ended up. Um, shooting. He did a shooting in West Covina Mall. Um, they tried him as an adult and he's still in prison to this day. So. So it seems like this is where you start finding your identity, which is your false identity. But now you're like, this is my identity. This is who I am, right? Right. So if we go back to um, this. So your parents were religious. You said they went to church. Mm -hmm. And but they were arguing and there was abuse in the home. So now you're sitting there like, well, I don't understand Christianity, right? right. And then. Now this, the, they separate. So the enemy came in and did his job, right? He came in and separated the relationship. And now a stepfather comes in. Now there's abuse there. Mm -hmm. At 15, or when you're going up there, did you have, did you tie any of that trauma to them? Or were you just like oblivious to like understanding that that trauma was causing you to seek this identity and this power and stuff in the streets? I had no idea. Like the enemy really did use me and I still was oblivious to it. And I just continued to um, push in that identity, um, the trauma and abuse, um, trying to find my identity in the streets, you know, as a gang member and um, not really understanding it. Um, I continued to, you know, we would have the kickback parties. And um, I remember there was a time where we were locked out, but the sister came home and <laughs> she kicked us all out of the, and we're all drunk and drinking and stuff. And she's like, you guys gotta get out of my apartment. You know, she yelled at the guy that had us there. And um, she says, you know, I was like, oh, as soon as she locked it, she was like, I was like, oh, my purse is in there. She's all too bad. You have to come back later. And so she left. And I was like, what do you mean too bad? So I took a brick and I just smashed the window and everybody went back in. I got my purse and I left. I said, that's what you get because you should have just opened the door, <laughs> you know. So that was my mentality everywhere I went. I was always... Um, fighting um and it just became more and more i became more known as um call anna you know she'll do it you know and i did um so as far as that that was like my teenage years um it just continued to grow that false identity inside of me and it, it it's crazy <laughs> so that praise and affirmation that these people were giving you was 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 lacking in the home 
So now they're they're like, oh man, Sister Anna is down. Sister call it Sister Anna should do anything, mm-hmm. and that's where we start finding our identity and we start finding who we think we are, right? So right. from there, now you're gaining power. Now you're like, man, this is who I am. And now, did you find your place in a place where you're like, I got to continue to live this, and I got to continue to perform, or this is not right? What is there a place where you're like, there you know, was a when- place, there was a time, a moment where um, doing the gang life and drive bys and and all this stuff that happens as gang members, um, there came a time where. Um, a homeboy of mine got shot. Um, his name is James, and um, my, me and my brother, you know, we're wearing the, the sweaters, you know, with the rest in peace, sleepy. And uh, we get to the funeral, like to the wake, and um, we're in line, to, you know, to, to you know give our condolences to the mom. And as soon as we give them a hug, she looked at me and my brother, and she's like, she called me by my nickname, which was for the family, Nuni, and my brother's Tito. So she only family members know that. So as soon as she said that, we looked at each other and she goes, don't you know who James is? And I went to school with this guy and and we hung out and we partied and stuff, but we didn't know that that was our cousin. And at that time, for me, I was like blown away. Like she's all, this is all your family. This is on your grandfather's side. Where are your family? And I was just like, no way. Like, and I'm looking, I started to look at my cousin in that grave. And I remember that was my crossroad. Um, for the gang life, I looked at him and the and, and he said like I know I heard the Lord's voice at that time, not really understanding the thought process. Um, the thought was, this is going to be your life if you continue. And even in that, like I looked at my brother and I said, we got to stop doing this. This is not, this is not what we're supposed to be doing. I just felt there was something more to life than this gang life, and for me that came that was the end of that. So I thought, <laughs> so. Yeah, so that so right there, you feel like God's tugging your heart, like, hey, it's time to change. Mm-hmm. And um, that happened to me similar. Like, it was like, man, something ain't right. But I went another, like, eight years wow. of in the slum. So how long, like, that encounter, what happened after that encounter? After that encounter, um, I was 18 at the time. And I just said, um, I got to do something with my life because I just, you know, I stopped going to school. Um School became like the second, like not anything that I wanted to finish. It just didn't feel like meaning, it felt meaningless to me. So um, 12th grade, you know, I finished. So I didn't want to do anything else. Um, I just figured out, just get a job and live my life. Well, in that time, um, I was probably about um, the drugs and, and everything still was there. I ended up trying myself saying I would never do drugs. I, w- I ended up trying um, um, the tabs and, you know, going to raves and, you know, when raves were underground and stuff. So I tried that and I was just like, whoa, what is this? You know, things are looking at me crazy, like pictures were breathing. And so I was like, no, I don't want to do that. But that opened the door for um, methamphetamine. Mm. So they're like, just try this. You'll like And I mean, there was a peer pressure of trying. And I was like, no, I didn't like that drug. And I didn't, you know, because you it can't like just stop it. It doesn't just stop. Like a buzz, you can eat something and it'll go away. No, it wasn't like that. Um, so for me, it was, um, I didn't want to do it. I have the per- peer pressure of. Um, methamphetamine, you know, they made a line and they're like, just try it, try it. Like for a half hour, like, and I was like, no, will you guys just stop if, if you, like, if I, if you guys gonna stop if I do this? They're like, yeah. So as soon as I did the line, I was like, Whew. and, um, which began, began my addiction. Um, I see my parents, you know, always, you know, I didn't know that that was the thing. Um, and I did it and, um, it opened up a door that I couldn't shut. Um, yeah, I was, um, to a point where, um, I ended up splitting my wrist, um, because I, I ended up being with a boy that his mom sold and, you know, he was like, here, get high, get high. And I worked. So there was a time where I just was like, I don't want to do this. And I couldn't shut it off. Um, so I figured if I just slip my wrist, put my wrist under the pillow and go to sleep, nobody will know. Right. Well, I, when I fell asleep, I thought, and the guy, you know, he came in and he'd seen the blood everywhere. And he was like shaking me like, what are you doing? And I was like, man, it didn't work, you know. Um, wow. he, uh, he was like, what's wrong with you? I ended up just 
I'm like, just leave me alone. Like, I don't want to do this no more. Like, what is wrong with you? Like, this doesn't, it doesn't feel good when you have to, when you're up all night and you try to go to work and function. Um, try to be a functional addict didn't work. So I try to take my life. Um, going to work, like God was always with me. Um, my boss was a, um, the owner here, they were young, but one of them was a, a medic or where they drive an ambulance. So he was real familiar. It's like, he see my wrist wrapped up and he says, Hey, what's going on? Can I see that? And I was like, Nope. And he was like, let me look at it. And I was like, no, you know, and I, and that moment I had got a phone call. Um, my uncle, the same uncle that an aunt that took me in as a teenager were in California. <laughs> it's crazy. Thank you, Jesus. It just reminded me. Um, so they were there in Cal in California and they, I got a phone call that they were there. They wanted to see me. So I'm like, Oh no, like I have this and I'm going through so much in this time and they're there. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll see them after work. So my boss, you know, I told him, I said, hey, my, my aunt and my uncle are here. Can I take off early? And he goes, let me look at that first. So I unwrap it and he looked at me and he says, are you trying to take your life? Like that looks like, he's all, if you're trying to take your life, you're supposed to do it this way. He's all, but do you need time off? And I was just like, no, I'm good. And I said, I just, I want to go check out my, my aunt and my uncle. And so I get there and they say the same thing. My aunt's like, she pulled me to the side. My uncle says, you look a little skinny. <laughs> you look a little malnourished. Um, if you're going through anything, you know we're always here for you. And again, they opened the doors. Um, and I told them, I said, no, I'm good. I'm good, uncle, you know. And they were getting ready to leave. I just got there in time. And I started going back to work. I left. I went back to work. And um, I started to feel like a tug. And um, I ended up leaving with them and going back to um, New Mexico with them. Um, and I stayed there a year and I cleaned up came back to California and started the same process. Um, but the same process of the smoking dope wasn't happening, um, just like weed and drinking. Um, um, and then I got pregnant. <laughs> well, actually before I got pregnant, um, my father, my dad, um, still in his addiction, um, was killed in Pomona. Um, my real dad. He was killed in Pomona, and um, it was uh, it was something that I didn't think I would ever have to. Um, you know, you think your parents are going to die of natural causes and stuff. And for my dad being uh, killed in his addiction, um, threw me back into my addiction um, with with a vengeance, I guess, um, because I wanted to know who did it. I wanted to take revenge because that resurrected that old girl that I was trying to fight so hard not to be. I wanted to know who. I had the power and the, the people behind me. I have family in Pomona that um, they're in the gang life. And um, they're like, they came to me actually. And they said, um, they said, we're going to find out who. And it's your call. And I said, uh, I said, okay. I was willing to to find out who did it and um, well they were willing to find out who did it and I was willing to make that call because I was my dad and I was his baby girl um, and they're not going to just kill my father that mentality started to come back they're not just going to kill my father and get away with it um, because we went to the courts and you know stuff comes up and you know you see people and um, family members come from you know that life um, in and out of prison and, and they'll take one for the team and they started to resurrect and they started to gather around me. They said, you're the oldest and you're his daughter. You make that call. And I remember being in the room alone and I looked at a mirror that my dad was supposed to hang for me. And I seen the hammer there and I just picked it up and all these thoughts, like you have a decision to make. I had a decision to make. And I just picked up the hammer and I, I just busted the mirror and I, and I just screamed out like, God, where are you? <laughs> because like, who's going to protect me now? So this decision to make. Why was there a decision now? Like spending time with your aunt and them, was God imparted, do you think? Was there a seed planted that's 
You were having a choice? No, it was just me alone with the Lord. I mean, it was just me in the room alone. And um, because my dad started coming around, like he was in his addiction in and out. He he worked, um, he was a, uh, in cement. Like he was, he worked, uh, he had a really good job. But every time he got a good job, like he would buy cars and, you know, he would take us out to eat all the time and stuff. But he was coming around and then um, his addiction would come back. And um, it was like a vicious cycle. Like since my childhood, so my dad's addiction, um, you know, would it would do good, and then he would, you know, go to church, and then, um, then he would get pulled to, you know, back to his addiction. Um, so for me, like my dad dying and and being killed the way he was, like shot. So they said um, that somebody knocked on his door, stood back, and then they shot him when he opened up his door. Um, so they, they ended up shooting him in the neck, and um, he died that way. Um, it was a drug house, so nobody wanted to call the police or the paramedics. Um, so that would resonate in my heart, in my mind, like, I'm going to find this person, and they're going to get what they deserve. I told my family, I said, I want you guys, whoever did this, I want you guys to catch him. And I said, and I want you to tie him up, and I want to have my way with them. And then you guys are going to finish him. But that was always my mindset. Like, that was my mindset. So, um, shortly after my dad passed, um, I ended up um, meeting a guy at work. And um, he came in, he checked up on me. Like, nobody's ever did that. For me, that was, I was like, nobody, everybody said, oh, you're strong. You, you can get through this, you know. You're so strong. How do you do it? Um, they didn't know the demons that were inside just manifesting and manifesting. And for me, that was my strength. Um, it wasn't so much uh, me, myself. It was just the things that possessed me. Um, the, alcohol, the alcohol, the um, drug addiction, the abuse. It was just growing and growing. Those demons were manifesting. And that was so my strength. Um, so shortly after my dad passed, um, I ended up getting pregnant. And when I got pregnant, because doctor said at 15 after that miscarriage that I would never have any children. If I was to get pregnant, I wouldn't carry the child full term. So when I got pregnant, um, things changed this time, you know, because I was really like, there was a time where I was literally on my knees crying out like, God, why am I here? Like, I'm a woman and I can't have kids. My mom, you know, she hated me since birth. So I thought, um... My dad's gone. My grandfather's gone. Like, I have nobody. Like, what is my purpose? I had no purpose. And I asked him, like, for a child. And um, so after my father's death, I got pregnant. And, um, I've seen it as a, like, I'm, I'm still here, daughter. I, I'm hearing you. So it literally gave me um, a reason to live because I wanted to die when my dad died. Um, when my brother went to prison, I was just like, I felt like a piece of me also was gone. But for me to get pregnant again was a true miracle. And I know it was God and he heard me in my deepest despair, I guess. Um, so with my pregnancy, I quit doing everything. The, the thoughts of um, suicide were gone. The thought of I'm not enough was gone. The thought of God hears me was more powerful than anything that was holding me in that moment. And I was so excited. <laughs> so it brought um, life back into me, um, literally. Um, so being pregnant and, and carrying something so precious that men said I would never have, um, God heard me and it changed. It began to change me again. I stopped smoking weed. I stopped um, getting high. I stopped drinking. I just quit smoking cigarettes. Um, it, it all just shifted. So. I'm going to ask you, um, you, you, when you cried out to God, God, why am I still here and stuff? Why do you think that was? Do you think that someone was praying for you? Do you think the encounters, the childhood from your parents, I know they were living it out, but they were actually still, right, born again, Christians, right, right. going to church. Do you think that was the reason why? Do you think your aunt's plan to see? Like, why do you think you had the ability to cry out to God, not even being a Christian at the time? Um, I believe that, well, because I, well, when my parents were going to church that, um, Greg Laurie, uh, we would go to his church in Riverside. 
um, when he first, um, I guess when he, because we were in a, I remember being in a play, it was called The Book. He was the, the Bible, and I remember, like, um, as a kid, giving my life to Christ. I think I was, like, six years old. Um, I gave my life to Christ, and I remember being in that that play, and I always remember this one scripture that I held with me my whole life, First John 4, 7, 8, because it was a song that we sang, and the beloved, let us love one another, for loves of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And I held on to that scripture my whole life, and I always remember, like, wow, like, being pregnant, like, wow, this is what love really feels like. Um, and I just, I felt like I was, like, the Lord was protecting me in that moment. I don't know, you know, it could have went either way because my cousins did come to me and they said, we got the guy. And I was just like, I said, no. I said, let him go. And I felt like the Lord was telling me, like, his blood is going to be on your hands. Um, he has a family just like you have. I didn't want somebody, the same people that hurt me, I didn't want to hurt him in that same way anymore because I really felt love <laughs> in that moment that they have. I didn't want them to feel the same pain that I was feeling um, for my dad's loss. Um, being that my dad was Christian, like I pray that he had long enough to cry out to the Lord for the Lord to save him. Um, even in his addiction, he knew the Lord. So, yeah. <laughs> That, that's just crazy because it had a similar wow. incident of power. Yeah, yeah so that's, that is, and feel, we feel the presence of God in this place right now. Like, yes. it's good. Amen. So, so from there, now you're pregnant, right? So what happens now? So I'm pregnant and I'm just excited. Um, am I going to take care of this baby? Um, me and my sister, we came to, like, she got pregnant at the same time. So um, we're like, my mom was like, Hey, I wanted to, because my mom was really excited. Um, I still had a lot of like doubt of her love, of how she loved me, but she reached out to me and I told her, I said, Hey, I'm pregnant. And she was like, no way. <laughs> so it kind of brought bonding back with me and my mom. Um, it brought back that bond of a mother, like the love that I always wanted from her. Um, maybe because it was her grandchild, but praise God, I took it anyways. <laughs> How whatever love she was gonna give me, I I was receiving it, and um, she nurtured me and my sister. She told us both to move in with her. And we're both pregnant at the same time. She cooked for us. She would wake up and she's like, no soda, no chocolate, because it has caffeine, you know. So here we are, like my mom really nurturing us, and it felt really good. Um, and I think it was just because they're grandbaby, <laughs> her grandbabies. Um, but uh, it it brought back a sense of. The love, again, it was just overflowing into my mom and then my sister. and um, So then we ended up uh, getting our own place because, of, you know, we were getting ready to have our babies. So um, we got a place together and stuff. And um, it was just, uh, I ended up moving back with my grandmother because she was like, Mija, you're pregnant. Grandma was, and I was just feeling the love from everyone. So I just was like, okay. So, you know, I ended up going with my grandmother and living there. She needed help. So. Um, having my daughter and, and living there with her was um, was different. But then again, you know, because I worked, um, I needed a babysitter. So my grandmother said she would take care of her. But then I would come home, you know, from work and my daughter would smell like smoke. Not really understanding that my grandmother, like here I am, like, wow, God really heard my prayers. And he's really like, um, when man says no, God says yes, right? So that was my mindset. I was like, yes, God is on my side. And then I come home and my grandmother's smoking around my daughter because her clothes would smell like smoke. And I'm like, grandmother, are you smoking around her? Because she was a heavy train smoker, you know, smoking six, seven packs of cigarettes, you know, all the time, like a week. So it was a lot. And um, so, and I would ask her. And then one day I just, you know, my daughter, because I breastfed her, you know, I really wanted to nurture something that I know was from God a true miracle and um i remember smelling her and again she smelled like throw up and cigarettes so i was like grandmother like why does my daughter smell like this and she was like oh she threw a fit today and i was just like i started to feel like a mama bear and i really wanted to that old girl was starting to resurrect again and uh i tried to believe her what you know she why would my daughter throw a fit she's like really heaven sent you know why would she throw a fit 
And so I just let her pass and I was just like, okay. So the next day I was breastfeeding her and I could hear like a little slight wheeze. And um, I was like, that doesn't sound right. And I asked a few people like, how my daughter, like, does this sound normal? And they're like, no, you're hearing things. And I was like, no, the, I felt like an urgency to take her to the hospital. When I took her, her throat was already closing up because of all the, the smoke that was in her lungs um, was closing up her throat. So the doctors started questioning me. The nurses came to me with the social worker. They're like, what are you, are you smoking? Are you smoking? You know, and I stopped smoking everything. So I was like, no, I'm not smoking. What do you mean? And they're like, if you didn't bring her in when you did, she would have died. Mm -hmm. So they had her like in a bubble. Um, oh and I was mad. Like, here I am trying to be good. And then the devil, you know, always comes in somewhere and uses people. And so it brought that old girl, like, I felt like I had, like, to protect my daughter. And um, I remember confronting my grandmother and, you know, I really wanted to hurt her. You know, that old girl started to resurrect and my aunt was there, thank God, because I probably would have hurt my grandmother. There's no end to what I would do, you know, especially now for my daughter. So that, so, brought, that was like, uh, I was already 25 years old. Um, I ended up getting, uh, I ended up, I had a best friend while I was working at the same place where I was working. I was a manager somewhere. So, um, he was like, a you know, older, uh, younger guy. Sorry. He was a younger guy and I was older. Um, but he really liked me. He was young. I was 27 and he was like 19 or something. <laughs> so it was, uh, weird, but, uh, we ended up getting married probably not until like, uh, she was like a year and a half. Um, we were still friends for a long time, but I ended up getting married and having a, a good marriage for a good 12 years or 15 years. She was 15, 14 years. So I ended up getting married. and um, But then <laughs> the drugs came back um, I, because I started questioning, like, uh, my brother in prison because of that still that not really letting go of the gang life. There was always things here and there, but I wanted to know because my brother... Um, what they call PC up. So here I am. I get mad and I don't want nothing to do with him. I was, you know, that, that gang life. So when that resurrected, I was like, ah, oh. but it's something inside me still wanted to know why. Why did he PC up? Like he's stronger than that, you know, mentality wise. And But we don't know what goes on behind, you know, and, and that back there. Well, I asked a question. I asked someone really close to me that knows about that life too and I asked him I said hey I want to know why and he looked at me and he said try to get us both killed <laughs> and I really didn't understand that because I don't know the prison life like that jail in and out yes but never a prison um so I asked the question I said and I want to know and so he came back and he says um excuse me um he comes back and he says when I asked that question, they looked at me like, do you love your life? <laughs> so when he came back to me, and here I am, I'm already live. I'm married. I live in Upland. I have a house. It's me and my daughter, my husband. And um, he came back with the, uh, uh, the drugs. And he says, I found out what you needed to know. Um, and he threw the drugs at me. And he says, and I'm not asking you. And I looked at him and I said, well, how much do I owe you? And he said 150. So I went in my wallet and I pulled out 150. And, I, and he says, and you can pick it up every Friday in LA, like he's from out there in downtown LA, you know. And um, he says, you can pick it up every Friday. I'll be expecting you. Um, so I did that for a long time and it opened up the door back to me using. Um, and uh, I thought I could use, be a functional addict. Um, and it took everything out from underneath me, the house, my husband, my kids, um, back into addiction, which I became homeless. I was dating a female, um, and my life was still spiraling out of control and uh, um, became, uh, you know, you let the enemy in and he takes everything. So um, I became homeless um, because I thought I could, you know, manage both. I couldn't. Um, I lost my kids. My daughter didn't want nothing. She's at this time, she's like 15. 
She didn't want nothing to do with me. Um, she's seen me in another abusive relationship uh, where the guy was beating me up and, and um, I ended up putting a knife to my daughter's throat. I don't remember, but she did share with me. I put a knife to her throat and I called her some names, which I still don't remember, but um, I believe her. Um, and uh, my life just continued to spiral out of control. I just felt like my kids are better off without me. My son, his dad picked him up um, one day and never brought him back. Um, and then my daughter left, like literally ran away um, to my sister. And I felt, wow, you know how the enemy talks to you. They're better off without you. Um, so that just made, it just opened all the doors um, to being that old person that I always try to suppress and do things on my own. Um, just manifested, um, being in the streets, um, doing my thing, um, free. And that's how I felt like free to do anything. Um, especially in homelessness, there's no, um, restrictions. There's no, um, there's no line drawn in the sand. Um, and I did that for six years. Um, almost to the date, um, me and my brother, um, Anthony, we got into like an altercation and he left, he went into the men's home. I didn't know. I just was like, you know, we came at each other's throat and um, he was going to hit me. And I told him, I said, I got something for that. Um, now you're a mark, you know, you're on my target. You're like, he was on my bullseye. I'm um, not knowing that he went into the men's home that day. Um, just me continuing to do my thing almost a year to the date. Um, things were shifting for me. Um, I started having encounters with supernatural beings. Um, it's crazy. Um, writing a book about it. Um, the encounters with God. Um, so with all this stuff shifting and changing, like, that's crazy. I felt like, uh, one time the devil was talking to me like directly, um, through another person. He says, Annie, 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 I can always count on you to be right here. Everybody comes and goes, but you, you're always here. And I started to think about that, like in Pomona, where I was always at, standing at a pillar, looking up at the sky, like, God, where are you? Looking across the street, there's a church and looking on my side, there's, the motel that I ran in the streets right there is like heaven and hell on earth. Um, I remember being in a motel room and, uh, you know, getting people high. And, and I remember asking the guy, Hey, can I use your room? I'll pay you. And he was like, well, bring me a girl. So, you know, I had, um, had girls out there in the street that I used to take care of too. Like a, I guess like a Romeo pimp because I would be with them too. Like my, there was no boundaries to my lifestyle. So guys, girls, you know, everybody, <laughs> it didn't matter. Um, I left now because that's, you know, I have boundaries today, praise God. But um, it, that lifestyle, being in the room, taking the guy, the girl, um, paying him, sitting at the door and just waiting for people to come through. Um, I had an encounter with the Lord. Um, I felt as I was sitting there coloring, um, there was a, a voice very clear, audibly, as I'm writing on my coloring and, you know, doing the tweaker thing. <laughs> there was a voice that said to me, if you don't get up from where you are, you're going to die. And I looked up, like, said that, you know, and I looked at the people and they're looking at me like, you okay, Annie? And I was like, who said that? Which one of you going to get it? That was my thought. And then the thought came like, you're tripping, you're tripping. So I just continued. I was like, I'm tripping continue to do what I was doing and um, again the voice said if you don't get up from where you are you're gonna die so I'm looking at them like which one of them <laughs> which one of them said that and who's gonna get it because that's it was so audible and I could hear it um, they looked at me and they're like are you okay you tripping Annie and I was like oh, I'm tripping I'm tripping I'm tripping don't say nothing I'm tripping and then I go back to doing what I was doing and again the voice said if you don't get up from where you are you're gonna die at that time, I looked at them, I looked across, and it looked like uh, little hunched over demons, like balls of, I don't know what it was, but it was ugly and disgusting. And I looked at them, and they're like, you're tripping, Annie? And I was like, I'm tripping, I'm seeing things, I'm hearing things, I'm tripping, I'm high, you know, thinking like, you're high, you're crazy right now. Um, so I text my sister, and I said, hey, and we we're talking because of the encounter with my brother, we got into it. Um, and I texted her and I said, Hey, this is what's going on. And I don't know what's wrong with me. I just need somebody to know with a clear mind that something might happen to me. At that point, um, I start to put my stuff away and try to stand up where 
I felt like there was something holding me down. Like there was so much pressure. My legs didn't want to work. And I just felt like I was stuck. So I texted the homeboy and I said, hey, I need you to come. He was actually my connect. I need you to come get me out of this room. I don't know what's going on, but my body feels weird. I don't know if it's because I'm high or what, but I don't feel right. And I can't get up. So he comes pounding on the door and he said the door like popped open. He was pounding on it so hard and the chain popped and he looked over at me and he's like, and I'm sitting right there by the door and he says, are you okay? And I said, just get me out of here. They started arguing about, oh, who, who'd you call and where, you know, what's happening. But um, in that moment, not really understanding, it was like spiritual. Um, he took me to the hospital. Um, they did a full body scan. They're like, nothing's wrong with you. They even had a wheelchair me, like he had to carry me. Um, and I was, they said, it, you're fine. Um, so not really understanding, um, went back to the same place, went to go get my stuff. The guy didn't open up. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to go get high next door. My sister, you know, at the trailer park, um, my sister lived next door. But as I get over there, um, there was a car there that I never seen before. So I walk over there. I told them, oh, start without me. Um, I'll be back. Who's at my sister's, you know? So I go and I knock on the door, kind of push it open. And my brother comes around the corner. He's like, boo. And I was like, whoa, you know, um, how the enemy had us before. Like, I still had unforgiveness for what he, you know, raised his hand to me. So I literally, like, I was like, oh, I'm out of here, you know. I start to walk out, and he says, hey, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to go do what I do. And he was like, Jesus loves you. And I looked at him like, who's Jesus, and why would he love me? Like, I don't even love me. I don't love me enough to, and this is what I told him, I don't love me enough to care. I don't love me enough to get off the streets, and I don't love me enough to go find my kids so what do you, who's this Jesus and I started to walk out the door and he says you know he's a God of restoration and I was just like I want to hear it kept walking out the door down the stairs and he says God will restore you to, back to your children Julian and Juliana and boom <laughs> mm. hit me right in the heart and I sat down like literally sat down and tears started to come like in the streets you don't cry that's a sign of weakness and the tears just started to come out when I look back, I know that was my soul crying out. And I wiped my face. And um, he came outside and he was like, you really got to want it, though. I said, how do I get that? And he said, surrender. I literally threw my hands up and I said, I surrender. I had to come to the end of myself. To understand, I mean, we know surrender in the streets, right? Cops come, surrender, and home invasions, you know, you surrender. Um, it was uh, it was different this time because the addiction immediately was gone. The thought of getting high was gone. He said, are you willing to go into the home? I said, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get my kids back. Um, I went into the home the next day. He called Miss Annette and said, hey. Um, can my sister come in? They're like, yeah, bring her. I went in and literally uh, I had a bag of clothes, but it was a trash bag. You know, I was, dump I was dumpster diving and I had to come to the end of myself. Um, and I have this bag of trash, all my clothes, and uh, I take it into the home. But as soon as like he took me, I'm going to tell you like this. When he came, I wanted to run. Something inside of me said run. Um... So we got in the car and he starts to play this song. It's called uh, Reckless Love. And, and I didn't want to hear it. It sounded like a screeching on the chalkboard. I was like, I don't want to hear this. And he just put it louder. When I told him I didn't want to hear it, he put it louder. And um, we get to the corner of Foothill and Gary. Or no, Foothill in town because we're getting on the freeway. Um, I literally wanted to jump out of the car. And as soon as that urgency came, I looked at the door and he locked it and he took off <laughs> and we got on the freeway and, and then he just rolled down the windows and I just put my head out the window and I was just, I cried all the way from Pomona to San Bernardino to the, to the Hallmark campus. Um, and when he said, you're home and he kicked, literally like kicked my bag out of trash, my clothes, he kicked him out of the car and he said, you're home now get inside. And he took off and I was like. Literally, the Lord really took my sense of direction. Like, I was a tweaker like, that would travel from here to there and everywhere, right? But I lost my sense of direction. As soon as he, like, I got out of the car, I was like, I felt like I was lost. But as soon as I opened the door, I felt like I was home. And here I am today, <laughs> still in full surrender, five years later. Um, 
there's a lot that has happened in between. Um, so being in the home for a year and a half really taught me how to love myself and forgive myself. Um, took a lot because we look at ourselves like, I'm good, right? And I even, I go and I speak to, uh, at the ARC, um, Drug and Rehabilitation in Pomona. And um, I wanted to congratulate them because when I told my testimony, like, at least you guys are here trying to get help. I was a knucklehead that didn't think I needed help. <laughs> so um, for me, it was really like a sense of there was somebody praying for me. Um, my brother, because I asked him as I write my story, like, what was your thought of, and he says, man, we've been praying for you. We caught a big fish. I didn't understand <laughs> the lingo of uh, that. But um, I remember when he said that, it reminded me of a time, the last time I was in jail, um, in and out, you know, always in and out of jail. And uh, I remember being in the hole because I was always fighting um, that I had an encounter there. And um, the Lord told me I was a fisherman and I didn't understand, but I do today. So, <laughs> so tell the people what church you attend and what are you doing now? Okay. It doesn't have to be with the church. Like, what are mm -hmm. you doing now? What is Anna doing now that God so, changed your life? Amen. So, um, uh, coming out of the home, um, and really wanting it, um, I was like, wow, I would see the women in the, in the church, uh, like, um, uh, Pastor Janet, um, Pastor Christy, all these, Pastor Veronica, like these are pillars in this, in the church. And I started to want to identify with them. So as they would teach, you know, and I started taking notes, the Lord told me I was a writer and didn't understand any of that, but I wanted, I desired that for my life. Um, then after the, after the, after the woman's home, coming out, going back to Pomona, I didn't have really nowhere to go. Things changed. Um, went to Pomona for three days and the Lord pulled me out of there again, which is amazing. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> but um, um, then Pastor Chris, because we, once they said they were going to open up the church in Pomona, I was like, Phew, like all this whole time, there was no Pomona campus. And all of a sudden, there's going to be a Pomona campus. I went to Al U, um, graduated. Uh, wanted more of what God, if this is, my my thought was, everything that I knew before was a lie. And if this is the truth, who am I? I dug, I searched, I, I studied, I wanted to know more, um, which took me to LU, um, wanted to know more of that. Um, and just, you know, my Bible study and him actually speaking to me, um, I have dreams and visions. Uh, dreams of prophecy. I write, I write unspoken word, a uh, spoken word. Um, just a lot of things that he shows me. Um, and I get to share with our pastors and leaders. So, um, where I'm at today is, um, a woman of God. I walk with integrity. Um, I lead discipleship groups. Um, anybody out there in the streets that, um, wants to know who he is and how he changed me, this is how. So, um, you know, through prayer and studying, the Word of God says that um, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So here I am, not a graduate of anything really, and, and wanting to know, okay, if this is the truth, if that's what that means, then I want to know. And it gave me a desire for Him, a passion for Him, passion for the people, like I was so selfish before, passion for like my a desire to want to worship with my kids and teach them in the ways of the Lord. Um, so it, there was a lot that happened in who I am today. So I'm still continuing the process. The, the process never finishes, right? <laughs> so. Hey, man, so if you can, can you look in that camera and talk to that young girl or that woman, whoever it is, and just prophesy to them and tell them right now you know, how they don't have to live that life and tell them, just speak to them right now. Just What do you want to tell people right now? Right. So what I want to say to the people out there that are in that lifestyle I know who you are, and I know the brokenness that you come from. The fatherless homes, the abusive homes, the addiction homes, the gang life, that's not who you are. I know because I walked it. I'm here to tell you if you just give God one chance. He loves you. He died for you. And there, his, his, this lifestyle, is there's no limit. In that lifestyle, there's limitation of the next leader, but God can raise you up into a leader for his kingdom. 
Let his kingdom come into your life. Let his will be done in your life. Let him raise you up into the man or the woman that he created you to be. Not for yourself, but for others around you. Now I can tell you that my lifestyle is affecting my mom. She's coming to Christ. My brothers, my sister, her children, my God, my daughter, my goddaughter. My daughter is actually serving. She came to the Lord being a raver and, and that lifestyle. God has something special for you if you just give him a chance. There's nothing he won't do for you. That hurt, that brokenness, he will actually heal you and restore you into the mother, the father, the brother, the sister, the aunt, the uncle. Who you're supposed to be, that's who you are. So, yeah. Amen. <laughs> like, can you just pray for them now? Just pray for those people that are yes. on the other, other side of this camera. Absolutely. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you for them that are listening and watching. Father, I thank you for their lives, Father God. That the lives that they have chosen to live, Father God, that is not who they are, Father that is not who you want them to be, Father God. Sons and daughters, Father God, for your kingdom come. Your will be done in their lives, Father God. I pray, Father God, that the brokenness, that toughness, Father God, that 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 tough guy, that tough girl, underneath all that is brokenness. So, Father God, I, I pray that you touch their brokenness right now, Father. The Creator, Father God, that you will create something special for them, Father God. That you, Father God, have created a life a, a fulfillment, a life of purpose, Father God, a life of destiny, Father God, a life of uh, a life to be healed in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for them, Father God, as they're watching, Father. I pray, Father God, that you, Father God, have uh, they have an encounter right now, right where they are. Holy Ghost, have your way, Father. If they've watched this far, Father God, that you have something special for them, that you, Father God, created them to live for eternity with you, Father. So I just thank you, Father God. Touch them right where they are, Father. Break the unbroken, Father God, break them, undo them, undo that lifestyle that they have, Father God, undo that mindset, Father God, right now where they are, Father, undo it, Father God, and, and touch that, that broken area, Lord, in Jesus' name, we love you, Father, and we thank you, just for today, Lord, today's a new day, that we can start all over again with purpose, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Cut! Yeah. <laughs> That was awesome. <laughs> that was so like, you know wow. What?